Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. Welcome to the second last day of the 2020 Peer-to-Peer -peer Global Dental Interdisciplinary Summit. Uh, today we have a special guest for you, uh, Dr. Jock Jernigan, uh, also known as Doc Jock 007, and I'll get into that in a second. <laughs> Dr. Jock, uh, uh, is, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, man. I know like we were talking about it. I know you're tired from how many days going strong with webinar after webinar after webinar are you looking at? 44 days consecutive. Whew. I know you're tired and looking forward. It's been great, but I know you're ready for a little break, but I'm honored and happy to be here. Uh, it's been it's great get, getting back into the swing of things. I was able to get our office back up and running last week, and I never realized how good it would feel getting back to sort of work in a normal schedule. So it feels great doing this today and being with y'all yes we also started last week and people are going back uh, uh from the uh, COVID era into the new dentistry era yep and uh, it's good to be back let me tell you uh, uh and uh i think all this time that we had to, to review and see all of these different webinars that were going on on different platforms might have been uh, very beneficial for our own skills and knowledge and uh seeing what other people say and uh, absorbing that information very and cool. building professional relationships for sure. Yeah, speaking of professional relationships, Doc, I, I can't resist to put this picture up because as I was telling you at that dinner, you uh, you just remind me of 007. So Doc, Doc, <laughs> 007, three letters, yeah. three numbers. Uh, it's a good fit. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's get started with your uh, wonderful bio. Um, Doc, Doc, Jock, or John, uh, uh, is a general dentist from Raleigh, North Carolina. He practices alongside his father in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, dental family. Excellent. The practice centers on treating extensive edentialism, utilizing treatment from ranging from the traditional removable prosthetics to the state-of-the-art dental implant restorations. I mean, I've seen you do some amazing cases, and I think the the audience is going to be very excited to see some of that today. As a senior attending the University of North Carolina School of Dentistry in 2013, he began to immerse himself in implant dentistry, focusing on how constantly evolving treatment options and advances in technology could benefit a growing segment of the population that are handicapped by partial and full edentialism. He has completed over a thousand continuing education hours related to implant dentistry. He firmly believes in educating the public about the benefits and options implant dentistry has to offer as evidenced by his ask doc jock youtube video series so if you were to add 007 at the end there'll be all three letters ask doc jock <laughs> he's a diplomat of the ida and a fellow with the icoi and uh doc jock uh upcoming uh superstar in the dental in the dental industry um you are uh, mostly focused on edentialism. As you know, it's a worldwide epidemic, uh, at least, yep. uh, uh, what do we have? About uh, 300 some million Americans and about a third of them are missing at least one tooth. And if you were, yeah. yeah. And I get 36 million are missing all of them. 36 million, okay. Now you stagger that by the numbers across the world. It's, uh, it's, it's, gonna, it's very disconcerting, right? It really um, is. So you're a, uh, you're a, uh, practice uh, uh you did you do any of those fillings and crowns and all that stuff when you started or you just jump into i have i again i have not done a filling since it might have been dental boards uh, maybe a few after in wow. 2013. um so I, yeah i haven't like done any you sound What's like an, you sound like an orthodontist <laughs> I, well I, I can't say i miss fillings um but I mean, I love what I do and I knew the practice I was going into and I knew even before dental school, uh, doing research for a prosthodontist, I mean, dental implants, they amazed me and I was very intrigued and I knew the type of practice I was hopefully going to be going into. And so even before I graduated dental school, I just started delving in, you know, I was weighing residency, you know, oral surgery, perio, pros, or the other option is I went a different route and I just went extensively at the end of my fourth year, I started taking a bunch of implant continuums and CE courses. And for the first two years, like every other weekend, I was doing a course and ended up racking like a thousand hours in those first two years of CE. Um, 
but I mean, I love ed dental implant therapy. I love CE. Um, and the more I you see, I took the more I realized I didn't know. And it's even more the case now, the way things evolve from week to week. I mean, all the new treatment yeah. options and stuff. And that's a big part of my practice philosophy is being educated yourself and staying up to date with current treatment options and now then educating the patients so they can make an educated decision on their treatment. Yes, you're right. It's very hard to keep up with also the digital evolution and all of these new products coming out. Well, with that said, doctor, the floor is yours. I will pull up your uh, presentation. All right, guys. Give me one sec. So okay, again, today uh, I'll be presenting on utilizing digital treatment planning and 3D printing for more streamlined and affordable full art solutions. Again, he sort of went through my bio. Uh, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our practice he, we were discussing is in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. I practice with my dad. It's a, a more, it's about an hour outside of our state capital of Raleigh. It's a much more rural town and it has an SES, a socio socioeconomic status, you know, the population anywhere ranging from some of the most poor people uh, in the country all the way to, you know, people who can afford these top of the line treatments. And the practice focuses, like we discussed, on treating extensive dentalism, anywhere ranging from an economy denture to some of these top of the line dental implant treatment options, uh, your fixed hybrids, et cetera, that we'll discuss. So, uh, like I said, dental implant treatments and you know are my passion. I love it. I love treating tooth loss. It's rewarding. Um, it's a puzzle when you do it right and putting all the different pieces together. Um, and I've been lucky enough to partake in some in the best, in my opinion, courses with regards to dental implant education in the world. Um, and I feel very blessed to have been able to do that. And beyond now, the other side, being able to educate and present to y'all. So it really means a lot to me for you joining. Um, so met goals for today, one, like we were discussing, understanding the prevalence of edentialism because it's out there and it is extremely common and there's a ton of people needing our our skill sets to treat them and treat them in a predictable fashion in a safe fashion but also with a myriad of options so we can cater to everyone's needs and desires so that's why we're also today i'd like to touch on all in my practice the traditional as well as i really would like to touch on some of these modern alternative solutions for treating these edentulous patients you know these full arch treatment options then sort of segue into the advantages of utilizing digital treatment planning in these cases then combining on top of that with 3d printing that I, a, lot, a lot of which i've been doing in my practice for the past several years and it makes things a lot more predictable as well as we're finding a way to make things a lot more affordable and keeping it in office which is great for us as well as our patients so again like we were saying the gist of these next slides it's extremely, edentialism is extremely prevalent. Like I said, 36 million Americans do not have any teeth and 120 million people in the U.S. are missing at least one tooth. And this stat is probably a little aged at this point. Um, and the percentage may be decreasing of edentialism, but with the baby boomer population, it's, we're going to see more and more of it and we are going to need to be able to treat it as a you know, general dentist. Because uh, like a U.S. population of uh, people over 65 is going to grow massively from 40 million to 70 million by 2030. And over a third of these people above 65 are missing all of their teeth. So there is going to be a great need in the coming years. It's not going anywhere. And we got to be able to fill this, not just for specialists, as general practitioners, especially with all the DSOs out there, your clear choices. Uh, it, it's just now much more predictable than it used to be so now general practitioners if well educated can handle these cases in their office and going back actually i did want to highlight the thing about edentialism is it tends to affect the most vulnerable in our population uh people that are aging and you know may not have a great amount of funds to pay for these treatment options as well as the poor the economically disadvantaged so it's not going to be the case where all these people are missing their teeth are going to be able to get these top of the line you know fixed hybrids we have to have a number of options that get these people back to functioning and an aesthetic so a little stat on dentures and i'm going to sort of i might have to fly through a few of these this is a longer presentation than 45 minutes but we all know the consequences of missing teeth you have a significant impairment of function people can't eat 
people who have issues with speaking. There's a huge issue with us, the psychological component. I mean, people uh, lose a ton of self-confidence, obviously. They try to avoid social situations where that people can see their teeth, where they don't smile. And that has a huge effect on their subconscious and ability to succeed in life, in my opinion. Um, and so uh, these things are why that type of practice makes it so rewarding because we can take these awful consequences and using our these treatment options bring people back from these. So sort of like I've been saying, in my opinion, we have this vast need to treat these edentulous cases, but we need to have as many tools in our tool belt to fill these cases so we can present as many options to these people and they can pick what's right for them. So they can weigh their needs, desires, their finances. And that's sort of the way I practice is you know, professional education as well as patient education. We cannot uh, make the decision for these people. They, everyone is different. Not everyone needs a fixed hybrid. Not everyone needs a two implant overdenture. And we have to weigh the differences and educate them so they can go home and make the decisions. So let's just look at sort of, in, at least in my practice, the traditional and some of these alternative treatment options I use uh, when planning these cases and, and providing this you know, menu of options for patients. So uh, when we're looking at the conventional edentulous treatment edentulous arch, what I look at, you have your removable options, your traditional dentures, your individual stud attachment, the snap-on dentures, your locators, your ERAs, um, super snaps, things like that. Then you have your bar over denture. With the, then you have your fixed options, your fixed crown and bridge, full arch, and then your fixed hybrid denture or your fixed hybrid bridge. Your FP1s, your FP2s, FP3s, and FP4s. Again, everyone knows we've all dealt with traditional dentures. Uh, there's a, you know, their advantages. They they fix the aesthetic. Um, they get, bring back a limited amount of function, and they're much more affordable for most people. We all know their limitations. Extreme limit of function, um, especially that lower denture. That is a nightmare. The full upper it may fit well, but it's covering the top of the mouth, so the people are losing, you know, it affects speech, taste, gagging, obviously, people will gag, um, the need for denture adhesives. So we all dealt with them. We all sort of know the disadvantages of traditional dentures. So this is sort of the class. And that is a lower denture. That's, I think we've all seen that. And there's few people that are truly happy with traditional dentures, especially a traditional full lower. You'll hear a lot of people say, I'm fine. I can, you know, I'm, I'm getting by, things like that. But, you know, when you really press them, no one's really eating what they want to in the manner of which they'd like to. And whenever you start to bring up implants with some of these patients uh, who haven't been educated on the options, you get quickly get, I'm doing just fine. I'm too old for implants. They sound painful. They're too expensive, which is probably obviously the most common one. But there's all these uh, stigmas with dental implants, this, this false narrative. And a lot of people think that you got to get an implant for every tooth you're missing. And they're all going to, all these options are going to cost $50,000. And that's why it's our job to educate them. And there's a lot of false information put online and by people that aren't dentists and some dentists put out false information. So proper education, both professionally and educating your patients and what that will do, maybe not immediately, but over time as they get educated, make them start realizing, okay, maybe I can, I can do this and this is going to be worth it. This is a proper investment uh, for me. And sometimes I'll tell people, I like, look, you'll go out and buy a new car and you buy a new TV every couple of years. Think about putting the same type of investment in something that could last you a lifetime and give you a lot more reward. Now let's start looking at our implant treatment options. Uh, sort of the entry into that is your implant stud the individual stud attachment, your loc like I said, your locators, ERAs, uh, things of that nature. We know the benefits of these. This is bringing you back to that first tier of function. Even just two implants on the lower can help solve that. Um, and when you get to four, I'm telling you, that thing is rock solid. And it still compresses, and you tell the patient that, but they are able to eat and do what they want to, and it's just extreme satisfaction. And like with an upper over, over denture like this, we're able to horseshoe the denture. I tell people, uh, implants on the lower is a matter of function. Implants on the upper is a matter of freedom because, you know, you can function with a full upper denture. You can't really function with a traditional full lower. But with implants on the bottom, you get that function on the top. 
you get uh, freedom. Yeah, it's going to stay in better. We can horseshoe it. You can get your taste and speech back and things like that. So it's a more matter of freedom. Um, it's a, a more much. It's obviously the most affordable of the implant treatment options. More expensive than traditional, but it, it is a great first segue into implants and getting people back to functioning. And what I love about anything removable is it's easy access for us. If there's a you know break, if there's a repair, we need to reline it or uh, for a patient at home. And when they're at home, they can easily pop it out and clean the denture, clean their studs. And that's a huge thing that I think a lot of people skip over just because of out of the, the glory of doing a fixed hybrid and things like that. We, we skip over when we're presenting these to the patient, the advantages of you know, something like this versus the fixed, where for it's at home hygiene, you're gonna have to be very meticulous with it. And with a fixed hybrid, you're gonna have to get up on her. It's gonna take a lot more time. And the the lot you know what the long term cost of not doing that is gonna probably be greater if you have poor hygiene with the fix, if you lose an implant or something like that. And then with the and then I tell them about the snap on denture, which yeah, it's not fixed, but think about how much easier it is for you to go home and clean it. And long term hygiene is obviously probably the most critical thing about longevity of these restorations. And when I tell that to a lot of people, they'll switch from coming in gung ho about a fixed hybrid or something like that to something removable. So that same patient, we that push that denture out with her tongue. Five minutes later, we present her with a snap on denture. And that thing, let's see her try to get that out. Again, just kicked out a lower denture with. And this is consistent. Even big burly men, when we provide this treatment, they can't get it out. And it's an immediate restoration of function. But so and, and it's just incredible. We're getting these people back to being able to one smile and talk with confidence, even with this first tier uh, implant treatment option. And also now we're, they're getting the function of being able to eat foods, healthy foods, um, you know, fresh meats, fresh vegetables and fruits, things like that. Y'all, y'all know the advantages. Limitations. Again, it's it's resting on the tissue. It's a resilient restoration, so you're going to get compressive movements. I tell patients who just do two on the lower. You know, it's going to hold in tight, but you're still going to have movement in the posterior. You may want to put a little adhesive back there and your tongue is powerful enough to pop that thing out. And we got to educate pa patients on the pros and the limitations, especially on the front end, rather than after we delivered it and they're complaining. Um, you know, parallelism, you got to maintain parallelism. If you're off course, it's difficult on the, you know, the restoration and getting it right, especially the wear and tear of the attachments. Um, and it's still bulkier than other treatment options. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the bar over denture. I personally don't do bar over dentures. I, I mean, they're a great restoration, but again, they're just as expensive as fixed, basically just as many steps. Um, and I found that I don't really need it. There are certain indications where you might choose to do one. You know, if you have a, a massive amount of restorative space, um, you know, then these things of that nature, uh, if you want a real, tight horseshoe on the upper. Um, and so there's still a good treatment option if you decide to do one again, but the same concept about hygiene and it's meticulous hygiene has to be expressed to the patient with cleaning under. And I do like that the implants are splinted for longevity and health. Now let's sort of look at some alternative treatment options. And I, I really want to touch on and that uh, some of you may or may not have heard of. The first is the conus over denture concept. Uh, this is sort of presented as the best of both worlds treatment option. Um, what we're doing here is that you, they're um, custom Atlantis abutments. They're telescopic, which just means it's going to be a, they're basically cylinders or cones, sort of like that. And the cap that goes onto them, it's friction. It's a friction based system where 
it locks in via that. You don't have any inserts or anything like that. Um, it's technically a non-resilient restoration. So it is uh, implant supported and implant retained. The tissue, the pressure is removed from the tissue. So you're going to be getting the rigidity and function of a, you know, maybe an FP2, a fixed restoration. Um, and at the same time, you're going to be getting the benefits, like I was saying, of something removable for, uh, you know, easy access for hygiene, um, you know, any repairs. Also, some patients need a flange to restore that the lip contour. And this gives them, again, the best of both worlds. And it's a pretty awesome concept. Quick, you know, a little comparison. And, you know, considerations. The only thing that really worries me about this restoration is you're treating it like a fixed restoration that's splinted, but in actuality, it's not. And you may be putting these lateral forces and things of that nature, non-axial forces, uh, fixed rigidity on top of individual implants. So I would advise if you're going to do this restoration, make sure you have ample uh, bone, uh, especially on the buckle. And I would use a adequately sized implant. This isn't something I would put a 3.2 or so, you know, millimeter imp diameter implant in and put a uh, conus on top of it. You're, uh, you're going to need a good amount of restorative space, about 12 millimeters at minimum. Um, these abutments, they can be correct in the maxilla, especially that angulation issue we were talking about, but that does end up cut, meaning you're going to need more restorative space. Uh, my concern also is over time, if the metal housings wear, you'll have to do a new pickup procedure. Then, but then if the abutments themselves actually wear, you may end up having to re replace the entire restoration. And you are looking at a lab bill similar to fix. So let's look at a quick case. At your implants placed, again, typically you can get away with four. I placed six in this just because I could, and I ended up only utilizing four. Same steps as fixed. You would splint this restoration if you can, open tray impression, send that to the lab. And then what you send back, at least my lab, shout out to Absolute out of Durham. Um, they do fantastic work. They send me back your custom abutments from Atlantis. Uh, then they fabricate a metal framework that's going to go inside the denture. And the first step is you pick, do a pickup procedure into that framework, and then they fabricate the denture around that. They send you a little mounting jig. There's that framework. Place the custom abutments. You can see those ones on the right had some angulation correction, making them a little bit longer. Place the caps. And then you do your pickup. And I found that to be, an, I've done several of them, and I think it's an awesome restoration. The cool thing is that over time, uh, these restorations will get tighter and tighter as they wear them more. Um, it, and they do, they function like fix. They hold in so tight that a lot of times you see that they, the lab will make like a little, uh, this little removal tool. It's almost like a crowbar to get that thing out. And a lot of patients need that. So I think that's a great option. Again, I'm giving the patient the best of both worlds, benefits of fix as well as the benefits of uh, removable. Now let's look at, you know, something that's been somewhat controversial, uh, but in my opinion, it's a great treatment option, you know, uh, is the mini narrow diameter implants. Everyone here knows what they are. If not, it's a very small implant designed for snapping in and holding in a loose denture. And they do a great job of that. Um, some of the biggest limitation is their one piece. So we're not able to change the connection. We can't change the abutment. So you tell the patient, you you know, with minis, it's gonna, if you just want a denture that holds in tight, great. This will help you get back to that and functioning. But if you think in the road, down the road, you want something fixed or a different type restoration, we can't change that connection. You're married to that removable denture. So I tell people that on the front end, like I said, educate on the front so you don't get in trouble down the road. It's a little bit more affordable option and it's a great option for people who don't have a lot of bone. Like I said, the limitation. Uh, the other big thing with minis, higher failure rate, especially in the maxilla, not as much uh, bone in contact surface area with the implant. And some people are putting fixed hybrids and do, on top of these. Uh, also, some people are putting single unit crowns on top of them. Personally, I wouldn't do it. Um, but for the people who are, you know, as long as they're educating the patients about the potential risk of doing that, and I'll leave that up to them. But um Hold on real quick. Sorry about that. Um, now this is a really cool, another one of these alternative systems I've been using the past several years. It's the 
uh, Lodi system from Zest, the same people who make the locator, and they're, it's a sort of their version of the minis. It's the, they call it a narrow diameter because it, it's a little bit uh, larger of an implant, but it's a locator over denture implant system. Um, biggest thing about it is I love it because it's so versatile. We have the advantages we talked about with the mini where it's more affordable if they don't have a lot of bone, but we have the versatility of, it's, of the two-piece system because now we can change the cuff, the, the abutment on it. If you want a healing abutment, you can put that on. If you need a two and a half millimeter cuff height, if you need a four millimeter cuff height, you can change that out. If they wear over time, you can change it out. So that's great. Um, you're also getting the versatility with the legacy, you know, the classic locator attachment system with the different uh, range of inserts for retention. Whereas with the traditional minis, you got typically one to at best three levels of retention and they weren't that easy to change where from one to the other so with this we have that massive range uh i think anywhere from zero to five pounds of retention so we can get the patient we can really key in on getting them the exact retention that they want um, you got the same multiple links multiple diameters you have a 2.4 diameter 2.9 diameter and now they've released a, a three point uh, i think it's a 3.4 which is great to help with those maxillary cases because we were talking about that higher failure rate. Um, but again, you can't be used for fix. I don't think there's even a possibility like there is with uh, a traditional mini, but, and it's an all-in-one packaging. So I, I just love the versatility. I think it's, I really enjoyed using it. Um, but let's look at a case. You can see we got an extremely narrow ridge. Got, again, parallelism is key and we, take our implant and place it. And in this case, you can put, you know, for healing, since you can't bury them, I like to use a longer healing abutment because of all that excess tissue so that it doesn't go over my abutments. And then that'll shrink and I can go back and put in a shorter implant for the final rest or abutment for the final restoration. Just great versatility. Little drone shot from the, uh, my, down at the beach. That's one of my passions. I'm a drone nerd and now let's look at, we've looked at the conventional fixed. Again, I'm not gonna touch uh, on this. I don't do a lot of these. Most of my patients either can't afford it. I tell people an FP1 full arch, you gotta have uh, a lot of bone, a lot of time and a lot of money to execute this properly. Fantastic treatment option um, where, you know, you're basically restoring just the tooth structure all around their mouth. So if they got plenty of bone, you're not having to restore any of the periodontal structures and you can get the implants. You have to get them in the exact, you know, exact uh, right spot. So they emerge where the natural tooth would emerge to get these to execute right. Um, and, and advantage of anything fixed, you can do a fixed temporary. So probably the most natural of all these restorations, but extremely high lab bill. You needed that, like I said, larger volume of bone, critical implant position, and it's harder to retrieve. Fixed hybrid, that's been the hot thing the past, I'd say 10 years now, um, where we're talking about all on four, all on X type restoration. We're, re, you know, we're, we're restoring not only the tooth structure, but the periodontal structures. Um, and there's just been so many cool advances in this, especially the past five years, but I'd say it's the hottest restoration out there um, right now, especially we don't need as many implants. Position is not as key yet. I mean, it's still important obviously, but not as important as the FP1 restoration. Less expensive, obviously, than the FP1, but still a lot more expensive than that snap-on over denture. And we were able to correct things with multi-unit abutments, things like that. Ability for a fixed tent and all the material options, zirconia, your traditional acrylic wrapped over framework. Now these nano ceramics are extremely promising. Um, you can do a zirconia with ceramic crowns. It's just pretty awesome, all the options we have now. And I think everyone's seen how big of a you know, market there is for it. You have the market for marketing to your patients, the market for the education. Clear Choice has built, I mean, a, a large part of their uh, system around it. And it, it's a quality restoration. Limitations, still very expensive. Position, like we said, you need that AP spread if you're going to cantilever back to get your first and second molar even. Uh, we talked about the hygiene. We gotta be very upfront with our patients about the difficulty with hygiene. Um, the follow-ups, the long-term maintenance is more expensive. Transition line is key. 
it's with a denture we it's we don't have to it hides itself with the flange with this if you don't plan it right and you end up coming back and if you haven't executed planning on the front end right and you haven't hit that transition line it's a nightmare um you need a little bit more prosthetic space um it's a little easier, a little easier to retrieve than uh, some of those fp1s but the other thing real quick this is anecdotal the proprioception issue uh with anything fixed all of the for, you know, forces are going directed toward the implants whereas you know with implant overdenture, it's still tissue borne. So you're, the patient, when they function and with our natural teeth, the PDL, they feel it when they bite into something. There's that sensation. Even with a denture, when they bite, they feel it on their gums, they feel the function. With these fixed restorations, there's no PDL around the implant. So they're not getting that sensation. So I've had set, in several occasions, patients come back complaining like, well, this just doesn't feel natural. I can't explain it, but it doesn't feel natural. And in my opinion, what it is, is the appropriate session proprioception issue where they really can't feel themselves biting into something. There's no feedback telling them that's what's occurring. Um, so I think that's an important thing to explain to people again on the front end. So they sort of understand it. I'm not sure if any of y'all have experienced that as, as I have. Now, real quick, I'd like to look at an alternative fixed option. Um, the FTX system from Zest. And I, again, I'm not paid by Zest or anything. I just think they're very, they've been very creative and innovative in providing these logical systems and they're more affordable. And that's a big thing for me and my patients. But what I, the FTX system, it's very similar to their traditional locator system where you have a housing that snaps onto a special abutment and you pick it up in the denture. However, in this case, instead of it being a removable denture, it's fixed in there. Instead of the little inserts you have there, instead of being the nylon um, with the traditional locator, you have a peak material. It's a much harder material that holds in very rigidly. And it is a fantastic option. It's much more affordable. It's, you know, all in one packaging, sort of like the, we, we talked about with the locator. And it's much easier to retrieve. It's really like you, instead of having to have your access screw holes, now you just basically, they have multiple tools you can use. They have a little thing that pops that thing off of those abutments. So it makes the, let's say the, fit, the temporary procedure much easier. You don't have to like, drill your holes through all the way through the denture. Um, you're, uh, you're reducing the chair time vastly, reducing costs. You can get some angulation correction and uh, you don't need near as much prosthetic space because of that. Uh, there's people have been very creative out there utilizing this. Michael Scher using it you know, as a rescue of a fixed hybrid restoration where a patient loses one of their implants over the fix, places another implant, but then can use this to pick back up in that fixed hybrid and utilize it that way um, so they don't end up losing the whole restoration. Uh, David Little, he, he, I think he's very familiar. He also likes the combination cases where he might have two or four of the FTX abutments and have to angle the posterior and use a multi-unit. There's just a lot of versatility in the system. And you can use pretty much all those uh, restorative materials that we discussed earlier. But we'll look at a quick case here. Implants placed, the special FTX abutments are placed. Uh, we got great AP spread here. For any case, that's be desirable. You place your special little housings and you pick it up in the denture, just like you would a locator. And then you polish it up. And I mean, it doesn't get more simple than that for a fixed temporary. And look, at, it, there's just not that much restorative space, but I think we're fine there. I've done, a, done some with a lot less restorative space than even that, and it worked out. So as you see, my, a lot of treatment options, and I think we should present all these to the patients and educate them on the pros and limitations of each and let them make the, uh, the decision that's best for them. Now, we present all this to the patient. How do we figure out which is right? Well, it's just weighing everything together, their needs, desires, finances, manual dexterity. Can they, can they clean properly under a fix? Can they get out a snap-on denture? with four implants or do they need just two? Bone volume, where can we place the implants and how much prosthetic space are we dealing with? You just gotta weigh everything and educate the patient and come to a conclusion. Like my big thing, manage the expectation for whatever they decide from the get go. Don't over promise and under execute. I mean, that's the biggest thing because that's when headaches occur, dissatisfaction, things like that. Another little drone shot. 
Now let's real quick look at the advantages of digital treatment planning in full large cases. I'll try to sort of zoom through this, or at least the first part of this, get moving along. So this is critical, like treatment planning information, regardless of if you're doing an analog fashion, or if you're doing digital. Um, I think these are the most important things that you really got to key in on the lipid line and incisal position that can end up being a huge nightmare for people like we discussed. Establishing proper video and knowing uh, the proper video and knowing ex your prosthetic space before you even start to plan dental implants. Implant position, AP spread, and emergence profile, so we've met, we've touched on. Lip support, do they need a flange or can they get, will the fix be good for them? Then bone volume and location. CBCT, I, don't, I wouldn't practice dental implant therapy without it. I know some people do, um, but I would not be comfortable. I, I feel like I'd be shortchanging the patient and it just makes it so much more predictable and uh, execution so much quicker and safer for the patient. And all of this digital treatment planning that I'm, we're going to be sharing is going to be based on that. So you might get lucky where you got this the older man who doesn't really even care about looks and you have all the world, the room in the world to hide that transition line. There's just no way he's going to show it versus your nightmare case. A 32 year old girl comes in who cares a lot about her aesthetics and wants a fixed restoration. And I mean, that's just going to be extremely difficult to hide that transition line. So if you don't see that on the front end and you go and play, she might have the bone to place the implants for that. But if you place them too shallow and you come back and try to fabricate your fix and she smiles big when she gets that and she says that big line, it's a nightmare and you don't want that to happen. So you got to see these things and explain it to the patient on the front end that you may not be a good candidate for this or that. Video and sizal. I mean, you hear it's going to change your prosthetic space because that pay, that attrition, when we go to make his final one, we're going to be opening him up. But also we're going to be adding several millimeters back to his incisal, which will increase our prosthetic space versus the opposite. This guy, you're going to end up probably chopping off four to five millimeters of his incisal, which is going to be a reduction in your prosthetic space. So you got to see all these things before you ever start planning your implants. VDO, again, you may have all the bone in the world, but if you don't have any prosthetic space, you cannot have an implant restoration. So you got to figure out what the proper VDO is. Where does that put you with regards to prosthetic space there and how much alveoplasty or whatnot, other things are you going to have to do to create adequate prosthetic space? Because this is very common in these full arch rehab, full mouth, especially rehab cases where they've lost their posterior dentition. They've severely collapsed dentition and VDO. Now let's segue into digital treatment planning for full arch cases. There are a ton of different softwares and things you can use. They all work great. I mean, it just depends on what you're willing or wanting to spend on it. I have always used, I started my journey with digital treatment planning with Blue Sky Bio. I mean, it was a free software. Other than, I mean, you pay a little fee to export your surgical guide, but I love it for what I've used it for. It's been fantastic. But all these other ones, you know, Co-Diagnostics, 3Shape, Exacad, phenomenal softwares. I'm just at this point have not pulled the trigger on paying for them because I can get by with Blue Sky Bio. I have a feeling when I, you know, as I push more into 3D printing of like prosthetics and dentures, I may want to move to a higher end uh, program, but it's been fantastic. And I mean, I'm sure you've all seen all these different softwares and you just pick what's right for you and what you want to spend on it. Advantages of digital treatment planning. Obviously, there's the anatomical mapping. We're able to see the nerves, the IN especially, the, the mental foramen that just keeps me up at night. Uh, sinuses, arteries, the you know, midline foramen on the lingual, you got to know those things. That If you don't know exactly where those are and you violate those spaces, those are, those are dire consequences. And the CBCT allows us to like I said, make it it's predict that, see it and plan around it and execute away from it, making it much safer and much more predictable. So you're basically performing these surgeries before you've ever picked up the scalpel. We're able to get the proper measurements, see exactly what size implants we could get in there. Uh, we are able to see our video and our incisal edge, our prosthetic space, um, our AP spread before we've ever placed the implants. And we can plan that along with the final prosthetic because that's the proper way to do these things is you plan from the prosthetic down because patients, you've heard it before, patients don't want implants, they want teeth. And you may, you've heard the nightmare cases of people, dentists who've sent it to oral surgeons or things like that. And yeah, they get it in the bone, 
but maybe it's a, a way too vast of an angulation discrepancy to correct. It's flaring out through the uh, the central uh, things of that nature. So it's not just about getting the implants in there. It's about executing it so we can execute the desired restoration down the road at the end and get the patient what they want and what they've paid for and what they've expected. So this allows us, what I love about it is this digital treatment plan. And I found it makes me much better as on the prosthodontic end, as well as the surgical end. And you got to mesh those together and digital treatment and planning really makes that easy and makes you a better practitioner, especially with dental implant treatments. So again, we're able to map the, the anatomical mapping. There's the IN, the foramen. We never stay away from that. Here, we're able to look, we get to see, we got an adequate bone, uh, buccal lingual bone for um, the implant we want. We see our emergence where it's coming out we, in our incisal edge, which we can predict our prosthetic space. Everything about it is just, it, it makes things so much more predictable. Now we can see our here, our AP spread. We're gonna have plenty of AP spread to cantilever to get the, the full arch dentition we want. And again, look at the emergence here. So. To note here, we had already figured out what the final restoration was going to look like in the end in our space, and we planned around that, and we can figure out our emergence. Do we need a multi-unit abutment to get this emergence? I mean, it's just pretty awesome. So what do we need to sort of start with a digital treatment planning for a case? Well, one of the most important things before you ever take a CBCT, before you ever start planning implants, you got to get the proper photos. That's going to give you so much more information than anything else. Shows you your height, you know, the smile line like we talked about. Collapse video, uh, things of just invaluable resources that you can go back and revisit when the patient's not in the chair. Uh, and you don't have to second guess things. Uh, CBCT, I've already touched on that. And then the STL file of the arch. Um, really what the STL file of the arch, that's just basically a digital... Uh, digital file for the model, your cast, um, and that's what you're going to work off of where you're taking that analog, that physical model, and creating a digital model to use in the softwares to create your surgical guides, your splints, your dentures, things like that. And you'll sort of see what I'm talking about here in a, a little bit. So how do you get that STL? Well, you take you can take your physical model and give it to the lab or if you have a desktop scanner scan it in and it produces the STL file. It's just a digital copy of that physical model. You can use your intraoral scanner if you have that and scan the model or skip the model and go all digital and just scan the mouth and that produces the STL file. If any of you are using intraoral scanners like your, your prime scans, opti scans, the trios, all those are just creating STL files that you're able to work on in the programs, where you fabricate your crowns on. The, export, the crown itself, when you export it, that's an STL file. Um, then you can also use your CBCT, little ROI. Uh, you can scan the physical models in that, and it, there's ways to produce the STL from that DICOM file. So again, desktop scanners, a lot of options. And your intraoral scans, plenty of options. CBCT, CBCT. little drone shot. So now let's look at uh, when we're planning these full arch cases, let's look at our uh, full arch surgical guide option. You have your tooth supported, your bone supported, and your soft tissue supported. Basically, the gist of these articles is that all three of these surgical guide, op full arch surgical guide options work. They're all accurate enough to make it a pre be predictable. Some may say, you know, a bone support is a little bit more accurate than mucosa supported. Others say mucosa supported is more accurate than the bone supported. Most do agree that the two supported is the most accurate, but all three of them are accurate enough and can be used predictably in full arch surgeries. So let's look at two supported, where in, with the two supported, you have some remaining teeth that are solid enough to stabilize the guide. Um, in a lot of cases, you wouldn't want to use this, obviously, in a severe perio case where the teeth are moving everywhere. Um, but if you have enough, typically I like at least four. Sometimes I'll get away with three, but I like four. Uh, you can use those to stabilize your guide and make it pretty accurate. A lot of times in these full arch cases, some teeth may be in the way of 
where you're planting your implant. So what do we do then? Well, we virtually extract them with these softwares where, okay, I want, I'm going to want to place an implant in the, you know, seven, eight, as well as the nine, 10 region. So I need to get those out of the way because I don't want to use a drill that long to get there. So I use mesh mixer, those other programs and even blue sky bio have tools to virtually extract, but I just still like the, uh, it just gives me a smoother cut and you're able to get that nice little trough to mimic the socket. So here we virtually extracted the teeth and now we can plan our guide and fabricate. It. And so here you have your guide where you place your osteotomies and your tubes and whatnot. So execution, we have our teeth, remove the teeth that are in the way, seat our guide. And that's the gist of a tooth supporter. Now let's look at bone supported. Uh, I'd say bone supported is the most technique sensitive of all of the guide. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But basically what you do is you have to obtain an STL, uh, basically a digital model of the jaw itself, the bone. We don't need the soft tissue. We need the bone in the jaw. And the way I typically do that is I send my CBCT because the softwares don't recognize the CBC, the DICOM data set as a physical file. It's just a bunch of it's hundreds of files, individual files, where you need to convert that into one physical, physical digital file that you can plan and create off on top of. I, you can do it yourself. There's programs that let you do it. I think it's a lot easier to give it to a third party and I send it to them. They do a fantastic job and a prompt job and they send me back that same file that I can start working off of. And then you start planning your case. You have your guide pens design. We've mapped the IAN. We know we're going to have to angle those posterior implants to get a proper AP spread, but at the same time, avoid that uh, mental framing. And you're then you're like, okay, well, then I can digitally re realize that I'm going to need a multi-unit abutment to correct that angulation. And you can plan all that from here. And we have already designed our final prosthetic, what we want that to look like, and we can see where our emergence is going to come out of, just like that. And you pr produce your guides. Here you have your bone reduction guide, which is the base of all of the se sequential guides. So it's critical, and we'll talk about that in a second. Bone reduction guide. Then you have your guide tubes for your surgical guide, your osteotomy guides created, and print. You can print the, the jaw itself, and you can actually, some people will do a desktop surgery before the actual surgery ever takes place, just to get comfortable with the anatomy and whatnot. Um, it's just pretty incredible what we're able to do. But here we have our bone reduction guide, osteotomy guide, and our implant guide. Now let's look at the surgery. So we've basically done the surgery already in our plan. The big thing about the, the hardest thing, and one of the reasons I think the issues with the accuracy of the full arch, or the, excuse me, the bone supported guide, is the issue with uh, you have to lay a massive flap because if you don't lay a big enough, you got to get that guide, that big guide to sit on top of the jawbone. If you don't lay an adequate enough size flap, then it's not going to seat. And some of the mucosa and tissue will keep it from seating. And if you try to proceed from there, your whole plan is just gone to squash. So the big issue is laying a big enough flap so it fully seats. So we seated our bone reduction guy. This is the next other little finicky thing about a, a bone supported guy is if you do not adequately reduce the bone, if you leave just a, one air, little area too high, the rest of your guides aren't going to seat properly either because that little bone is going to be holding them up. And like we said before, if it doesn't seat like it should, your whole plan goes to squash. We seated our osteotomy guide and then we place our implants. Implant guide, implants placed. We've got our multi-unit abutments that we had, again, we already knew we needed them. We knew that what angulation, we needed a 30 degree in the posterior and straights in the anterior. And we knew at what point did we need to stop the rotation to get the emergence like we wanted? And let's compare. So there's our pre-up plan. There's our execution. Pretty spot on. I mean, it's just pretty incredible to see. And again, just looking at the pre-op versus the execution. So pretty, pretty cool. Now, real quick, I want to touch on the bu uh, buckle bone guide. It's another type of bone supported guide. It's really where everything's moved towards most lab systems. Their guided systems have gone toward because there's several advantages to it. And basically what it means is with a traditional bone supported guide, it seats on both the lingual as well as the buckle. And so you really need a massive flap to get it to seat on both the both sides adequately. 
here it is just going to be sitting and supported by the buckle. We don't need to extend the guide to that lingual or palatal surface. So what does that mean? Uh, again, Crum, all these labs, you've probably heard of them. That's where they their systems have evolved to. They're pretty incredible systems themselves. Well, the advantages, we don't need near as big of a flap. It's much less invasive. Uh, the, the sequential guide's more forgiving. We talked about where we talked about if you didn't reduce enough in the a traditional bone supported guide, I wouldn't see it here. There's little forgiveness because it's not seating the same way. Um, and there's several types of these systems. You know, you can do where you have sequential guides that you unpin each one and put the next one on. But again, most are moving to the stackable guides where you have your base guide that, that pins in and it's typically your bone reduction guide, but then your sequential guides just snap on top of that. So you're not having to pin and unpin every, take off each guide every time. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable and pretty awesome the systems are created that are just making the surgeries go by that much faster. So again, you, you use the natural teeth, make your guide pin osteotomies, place your bone reduction guide, pre, uh, proceed with your alveoplasty, osteotomy guide, and so on. Drone nerd, like I said. So now let's real quick look at our soft tissue supported guides. And all this means is the guide, the retention of the guide, stability of the guide is gonna be based on the soft tissue, basically just like a denture. And how do we begin the fabrication of that? Well, the issue with these guides is we're having to align soft tissue model with the hard tissue CBCT. The CBCT doesn't really register soft tissue, so we have to align those two things in 3D space because we want the implants in the bone, but the guide's gonna be on soft tissue. So they have to be in the proper three-dimensional space and aligned correctly. And how do we do that? Well, basically you start with a denture. And if you, they don't have a denture, that they one, they need to like the appearance and like everything about it. And you can go from that. With the dual scan, you take the old denture, you do a reline impression, get a very good impression because your retention and stability are gonna be based off that impression. So if it's not a very accurate impression and it's not very stable, your guide's not going to be stable. You take that and with a dual scan, you do the reline and you place these radiographic markers and take your CBCT and then you can align the denture and you'll see sort of what I'm talking about in the, the software with this, the CBCT scan. Or I like the triple scan technique where you duplicate that denture that they like the appearance of. And if they don't like the appearance, you're going to need to start from scratch and get to where a, at least to a try-in stage of a denture that they like the appearance because everything's based on that. Your incisal edge, your prosthetic space. But you duplicate the denture in a barium sulfate material, which is radiographic, and will show up in the x-ray. You do the same thing, a reline impression, and do a scan, take a CBCT scan in it, and see you see how that denture shows up. And then you pour up a cast uh, around it and make these little divots to, so the software can use it to help align everything. And you scan, the lab will do a, a, a scan of both the duplicate with the model as well as the model without the duplicate on top. So the, the scan of each of those. And you do the scan and then you use these points. You first align the, the denture model and that's the main reason why we're using that denture, same as those radiographic points with the dual scan, to align in the software. So it aligns that denture, but then we're able to align the soft tissue model with that, uh, with the model with the duplicate on top. And you align that, and then now we have accomplished what we wanted to in aligning the soft tissue where the guide will be fabricated with the hard tissue where the implants will be planned. We can see our emergence through the soft tissue as well as the final prosthetic. Proceed with the guide fabrication, and there you go. Real quick, we'll look at a case. Great retention, especially with the maxillary, you can get phenomenal retention here. Um, and sometimes, just depending, I don't always use the stabilization pins. I find I don't need to. It gets plenty of stability uh, just as is. And look at the execution. I mean, no flap laid, minimal bleeding, uh, it, it's just beautiful and the patients appreciate it so much. They're amazed. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't feel anything. I didn't have any post-op discomfort. There's no inflammation. There's just so many advantages to this. If you have, in my opinion, you need an adequately, an adequate size ridge 
um, to do it comfortably. Um, but when you have it, uh, it's pretty awesome. So you can, there's a spectrum of how to utilize surgical guides anywhere from just doing a pilot guide, which I do plenty of times, especially in the maxilla, if I'm going to use like osteodensification, densa burrs to create um, a more dense osteotomy at a site for my implant. You can take it to where you do fully os every osteotomy up and then place the implant yourself. Or you can take it all the way to where there's a guide for implants. And now the next step where everything's guided all the way from the pilot, osteotomy, implant, and the final restoration or the temporary restoration is pinned into place as well. And everything's guided that way. And you do your pickup guided. It's pretty incredible what you're able to accomplish. It's whatever you want to choose. How do you execute these types of treatments? You can, you know, outsource everything. If you just want to send everything to the lab, they can do, you know, plan your case, design and fabricate your guides and temporary prosthetic. You can do you a little combo where you plan the surgery and you design the guide and the software, then send it to the lab and let them fabricate it and create your temporary. On the other end of the spectrum, you do everything in-house. And I do too much of this. It's just my nature and keeping costs down for my patients. But where the doctor plans everything. They plan the surgery, they design the guides and fabricate them, and the temporary prosthetic. And 3D printing has made that much easier uh, for dentists. I think the best is to do a combo of the two because it's invaluable. A good lab is just so invaluable. Their knowledge and they can pick up on things that you might miss. I mean, they see a lot of different cases that you, and so they, have a keen eye for these things. And I think the best is to combine it, utilize their knowledge, and but also maintain some autonomy in the planning of the case. And real quick, again, 3D printing, that's changed everything about the way I practice. I did nothing with regards to digital treatment. Well, I digitally treatment planned, but I didn't really mess with surgical guides until I started 3D printing four or five years ago because it was so expensive. Um, a full arch, even pilot guide was over a thousand dollars. And it was, again, my, my patient base, low SES. I, I was lucky if they were able to afford these implant treatments, adding on another massive bill may have been the difference in them being able to proceed with treatment. So I did most everything freehanded until I started delving into 3D printing because it's made it much more predictable, but also affordable for me to do these things in office. Um, so the highlights of 3D printing, Affordable, it's compact. It doesn't take up near as much space as a mill. It's not as expensive as a mill. The materials aren't as expensive as milling. Uh, you have a ton of material options from surgical guide resins, things like that we'll touch on. They're very accurate. They're relatively fast and they're getting faster. And it's a, just a much more practical thing for a solo practitioner, or, or, I mean, a private practice to have in office. What, can, well, what are we utilizing in 3D printing and dentistry for? Well, a lot of stuff surgical guides, printing models, uh, analog models, custom trays, bite splints, ortho uh, retainers, casting, um, you name it. And we're moving now, what I'm really starting to focus on is printing dentures. I mean, it, it's just pretty awesome. And provisional restorations. Surgical guides. We talked about the bench top surgery. Um, custom trays, analog models. These were printed and it's before the surgery ever took place. Nowadays, and I was able to fabricate a temporary restoration on top of this, knowing where the emergence would be from because of these. Nowadays, you would probably just take this all the way digital and then fabricate within the program your provisional and then print it or mill it out where you're not dealing with any physical models. Uh, the temporary denture. Uh, I've been to the IDT, the uh, International Denture Symposium in Phoenix and Atlanta the past few years, and I've been blown away. Before I went, I was like, we're five or more years out from 3D printing. And that's not true at all. We're there already. I mean, it's pretty incredible the advances that have been made. Um, it, you know, you have your material. The big thing with these, it makes it a lot more affordable for patients. But uh, and you have a, you can take it anywhere from a basic economy denture all the way to a beautifully characterized elite denture. Um, a lot of options there. The big thing with it, the long-term research about the wear on these things is not out yet. So they're really only recommended for a temporary denture at this point. But with each year, again, carbon and uh, lucitone have made a big stride in that recently. 
for more long-term type material. So it's coming very, very soon if it's not already here. We talked about the fully guided system where you pin your uh, your temporary prosthetic into place. So you in office can do all that planning and then print out your fixed temporary and pin it into place and it costs almost nothing. And you've already got your holes planned out and reamed out from your planning. And it makes you imagine you've done your surgery, it executes as you planned. You go in then you clip this in and you have your uh, temporary copings and they should slide right in if your plan went accordingly and then you pick up and you can characterize this as much as possible but maybe cost 15 bucks and it's just awesome for that so uh we talked about the limited data and again milled is still probably a better long-term uh material but i think we'll get there very shortly with the 3d printing dr michael share he's another one of my mentors uh he has so much information online I've loved following him the past ever since I started practicing him before, but he's really pushing the envelope on taking this to a fully digital process where you never are taking any physical impression. You take a digital impression. You have your digital STL models like we were talking about. Take that to your software, digital, digitally print your your guides, your temporaries, and even now your finals. And, and he's really pushed the limit on that. And these new scanners are able to take these soft tissue impressions. So pretty cool. Weighing the options on the, if you're going to delve into 3D printing, which is right for you, there's a ton of options. Really, I mean, you have anywhere from, you know, some of these printers you can get for $3,000. Uh, I have a Form 2 that's about four to $5,000. Um, it just depends on what you're going to use it for. They go all the way up to then the carbon, which is a $100,000 lease. But, I mean, it just, what you have to weigh is the cost, how fast, you know, speed, how fast do you need something? How often are you using it? Are you using it once a month for a single surgical guide? Or are you printing multiple models, multiple surgical guides every day and you need something that's fast and you need something that platform size you can print a lot on um, and you need to decide the material options with each printer because they're not all the same. Um, it, you need surgical guides and if you need model resins, things of that nature. So you just got to weigh everything and pick what's right for you because there's a ton of options. So real quick, I'm going to show a video that sort of ties this all together and then we'll wrap it up. So this was back numerous years ago. I don't really use the that type of guide system where you have to have your little um, little pin in place. You sort of jump ahead and then you lay in your flap and then you proceed with your alveoplasty. So you 
place your implants. This was a sort of a different way of doing things. Now place your implants. So in that case, nowadays, what I probably would have done differently, I probably would have gone with the use the natural teeth and done a buckle bone guide um, rather than doing it that way. But it, you can see you know, this from several years ago, it worked out well. Those are my brothers. Uh, I'm the middle child. Definitely have the middle child complex. But there's my parents. This is us in Montana, and that is my lovely niece. Uh, I tell everyone I'm quite content just being an uncle for at the moment. <laughs> But um, I really appreciate everyone being here. I know this is a lot of information, but uh, I think it's important. And you saw and seen the whole picture and how to take it from when the patient first walks in the door to executing these treatments and weighing it all together. If you have any questions about anything, I know I sort of blasted through a lot of information. Feel free to email me at any time. Uh, Jock Jernigan, DDS at gmail.com. If you ever want to text me and ask me a question, please do. Uh, I put a lot of this stuff on uh, on Instagram, a lot of these cases, and I love interacting with people on, on social media. So I'd love you to come follow me um, if you're interested in that. Ask Doc Jock on Instagram. Also, I created a series, he mentioned it at the beginning of this, on YouTube several years ago, just with regards to patient education. We do free initial implant consults, and I wanted to take it a step further to make that even more valuable. And I made a bunch of educational videos on these treatment options and on the dental implant uh, treatment process for these patients. And if you ever want to utilize those for educating your own patient, feel free. Uh, that is also at ask.jock on YouTube. But thanks again, guys. And sorry, I ran over. It's a ton of stuff. Hold on I there appreciate it. Uh, y'all for being here. Hold on there a minute. We're going to ask you a couple of questions. What's now? happening? <laughs> Go, uh, okay, Doc. Uh, are you out of the full screen mode? Can you see me? Yeah. Oh, Perfect. maybe not. Let me get rid of that. Hold on. I, I, let me fix that real quick. Sure. Does that work? That works. Can you see me now? Yeah. Should I just close out of the, the PowerPoint? You can. All right. There we go. So, uh, Jack. Hopefully no one's asleep. That was amazing. Do you know how much information you just gave to our younger colleagues or our colleagues that want to get into the world of full mod rehabilitation? Probably probably too much information. No, I wish somebody gave me that information. Probably too heard. much. You know, tomorrow we have our last session, uh, the last specialty that we didn't actually include so far, but we have had everything from pedo and we're doing pathology tomorrow. But what you brought to the table was very, very important. I remember, and a lot of my friends that are in this, in this space, uh, had to travel to multiple different uh, educational facilities to gain an understanding on how a lot of these things work. So let's get to it now and ask you a couple of general questions that probably someone is uh, uh, is contemplating right now out there. <clears throat> Printer, what's the difference between removable and fixed? How do you decide what, which one to get? Wait, what about the printer? Some printers print fixed material. Some people, uh, I mean, fixed prosthesis. And some, some printers are more good for dentures. Uh, is there a, how do you choose? How do you go about choosing what you get? As, as far the materials, uh, from what I've seen, are the same that you're going to, if you're printing, regardless of it's a, a fixed printed, uh, let's say fixed, a temporary hybrid, you're going to print in the same material at this moment you would print in the same material as you would um a removable denture because you, you can't print a peak or other type materials like that you're it's the same type of resin so it's basically yeah it's the same so the printer okay and how does that measure to like say something like serif cost wise <laughs> <laughs> Man, not even close. Unless you're going with a carbon, that carbon printer, which is like a hundred thousand dollar lease, you don't even own it. But it is it's sexy as hell. And you get a, I'm tempted to do it because you can get the an incredible printed pair of Adidas. Uh that that's the only way you can get it is if you get the printer. Um but no the Seric what is it at now? Is it still over a hundred, I think? 
Some Tariqs um, are in the 60s, some are over 100, yeah. But yeah, you the form two, for instance, is like four to five thousand dollars. So you, it's not even in the same ballpark. And there's multiple options at that price point. There's some at like I think the next dent's like fourteen thousand, um, but it's nowhere near the cost of most traditional like in office meals and things like that. Let's talk about guides. Do you always use a guide, Doc? I do not. I still will do freehand cases. It just depends on the case uh, and what I'm trying to accomplish. Sometimes if there's a ton of bone, I'll just go and freehand it real fast. Other times when there's not a lot of bone at all, like an extremely dentulous mandible, I will just feel more comfortable because I'm not going to be able to get stability with the soft tissue. And depending on the anatomy, I'm probably not going to get a lot of, I'm not going to be able to lay a big flap because the framing might be on the crest and it's safer to just sort of freehand it and really go in there and eyeball it and know you're executing it that way. So there's still a number of times when I'll do a freehanded surgery. Same here. Um, sometimes I, I mean, a lot of times guys are great. Fully guided surgery is wonderful, but sometimes I find them to uh, interfere with my surgery. Um, so, and uh, they're not always 1000% uh, yep. accurate. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes you have to do some adjustments here. Correct. Point. There's yeah. plenty of room for error. Yeah. So let's talk about telescopic. And exactly what you just said. You got you. you got, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I'm I'm, I'm curious to hear what you have, what what you're gonna say. Oh no, you're exactly right. I mean, guided is beautiful, but you have to be able to. You got to be able to pivot if it's not. You might thought you were had a great sight, but the bones awful. It's and you don't get any. Uh, stability with the implant or when you're extracting the teeth if they're abscessed it's very easy for that buckle plate to break off on extraction and at that point that's really not a good site to place the implant so you got to be able to pivot and alternate your plan and make those decisions game time you cannot rely on the guy your know, dr mish once said um if you're only doing full mouth rehabilitations full arches and you're starving what he meant by that is that patients constantly come back for issues uh, uh, restorative part is really hard and you come married to these cases. Obviously that's not always true because you build a career around it uh, yeah. and you still have most of your hair I see. So uh, how do you, how do you uh, explain that? There's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's exactly right. Cause th that's, it's all, a, that's why I'm so as young as I am, unfortunately I've learned managing expectation from the get go is the only way to help alleviate some of those issues because people, and even with that, you're not going to alleviate, you're not going to prevent that from happening because people just have unreasonable expectations a lot of the time. Um, and it doesn't take a lot to, to raise your blood pressure. It might take one out of 30, one out of a hundred headache patients that come back to bother you. But so those still exist, especially when you're dealing with full arch restorations, those higher end ones, they, these people, They've got very high expectations. They feel like they've, and they have, they've worked hard to get to a point where now they can afford this type of restoration, this Cadillac restoration. And they're expecting it to feel like natural teeth, but realistically, it's not going to feel like natural teeth. And so you just got to, at least in my opinion, you got to be on top of that and express that from the get go. And that's your only hope. But you're still going to have those headaches, those things, those patients that keep you up at night. Um, but yeah, it's, that's that exists in this type of, I guess, any dental treatment, but especially with these type treatments. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, it's good to know that you're not the only ones here dealing with this kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, tell me about uh, another uh, question that uh, Dr. Amit Shah just brought up, which is interesting to me as well. Do you prefer um, snap on or friction grip, like telescopic? Which one's better, in your opinion? Yeah. With, with regards to preference, it just depends on the case. Um, I think the 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 traditional snap on over dentures, I, I love it. It's much more affordable, obtainable for the patient. How often do you have and to do the parts? How often do the you inserts? Yeah, it depends. Some people come in every like three to four months. Other people I don't see for like four years. It's weird. It, that a lot of that has to do with angulation. If they're properly paralleled, those inserts will wear a lot. Like a lot slower it, like in the maxilla if they're off angle they're going to wear faster um and some people just 
like coming in there and saying they need them changed. They want it super tight all the time. Other people get by with that, but uh, with regards to preference, what's that? Did you charge for changing the inserts? Do you let them know oh, I, before you start? Absolutely, for sure. I make them sign again. We have our consent forms, but then I also, after our consult and they've accepted treatment, I make them sign a thing. It says a lot of stuff, but it also talks about long-term care. It's like you'll be paying for inserts, you'll be paying for X-rays, right. sure. exam. Because that's the problem. The other, like, I'm glad you brought that up. Is people don't say that, and then people assume that they pay for inserts for the rest of their life. Yeah, I don't not- know how many cases like that I got stuck on in the last ten years, but I do something similar now. But they would come in and they just expect it. Hey, I paid you uh, X amount of dollars, and uh, yeah, and then try to argue with that. Uh, you can't. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's just going back to be it like up front, like anally up front. I'm not anal about a lot of stuff. I'm pretty type B, but this kind of thing, I hate dealing with after the fact headaches. But um, with regards to the preference of between the two, it's, it just depends. So, like I said, the especially with four implant locator over the that thing's solid, man. They can eat what they want to. They're still getting tissue compressive forces, but most people don't care. Now, the telescopic, that thing, it holds in. That is tough to get out. Like a lot of time, like that conus, they're having to use that tool to get that thing out. Like it's like a crowbar. And you they are getting that right with water that goes underneath there, or like you blow it up. That it with the the, the 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 FTX does that zest system yeah. does. The con, the conus has that tool, um, but uh, the telescopic, it does give them that rigid feeling when they bite into foods that that it's not really it's not compressing like an overdenture would. Um, and you're able to get a little bit smaller of a restoration. It's sort of that spectrum where, you know, your crown and bridge is the, the smallest restoration. Then your hybrid's smaller, a little smaller than that, or a little bit bigger than that. Then the conus is about the same size as a hybrid. Then your your overdenture is still going to be pretty bulky. Um, so there's advantages to each, but it's a lot more costly. And can they get the same satisfaction for like a half the cost in the snap-on denture? Sure, that's okay. That's wonderful, Doc. Uh, um, one final question from the audience: Are they gonna want to keep you here all day? Because you got so much knowledge that you're sharing here, which is wonderful. Um, so the question is that if you, you know, you have a guide, how do you know that your exact cor- apical coronal placement of the implant, if there is a certain give in the burr, you know how the burr gives a little bit in there? Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. There is going to be that discrepancy with with any of the surgical guide system. Uh, one of the big things to alleviate that is decrease the length of your osteotomy. The longer, if your guide's way up here, the tube, and let's say the end position's way down here, you're going to have more area for that angular divergence to occur. So the closer you can bring it down, and that's why bone support can be so accurate because you're as close as you can get but the question final I think is that if you're not if you're not provisionalizing that arch, and you're actually uh, uh, wanting to uh, get, uh, 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 I mean, if you're provisionalizing and you want to get an immediate and, and it was prepared for you and you're not making up for it in a prosthetic and it was done for you by the lab, how do you how, do you do it that way or do you actually make up for it when you when you uh, pick up the, the the temporary cylinders and all that? Like in a traditional t- fixed temporary, or is he more yeah, referring like to all like on the all on six or all on X, whatever it may be? Say a patient comes in, you take all the teeth out, you put the implants in, and you want to put the provisional on, and the lab <coughs> theoretically would make you the 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 the, the right. provisional with holes in it, right? Yeah, and if you're with regard to that, the discrepancy from your your plan uh, implant placement plan, it should it shouldn't be that far off. If there's discrepancy, it's not going to be big enough that it's going to drastically change where the implants are going to be, you know, generally located, especially if you're doing a traditional fix where you maybe take their old denture and you use some uh, impression material or bite registration and you're going to do the, you know, you're drilling out your holes. It's not going to be that far off. And even with the fully guided system, everything's based on the same plan. So if if the implants are off a little bit, the subsequent guides, including your, you know, your planned fixed temporary, will be off in the same direction, um, to an extent. So it shouldn't be too big a deal. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, uh, Doc, uh, thank you so much for your knowledge and your time, and uh, 
and for uh, bringing all this to us. Um, for sure. Thank you all for having me. And, put, and again, that's a lot of information. Thanks for anyone who's stuck with it. Yes, and uh, they know how to get a hold of you. Ask Doc Jock on Instagram, and uh, yeah, at, and what are, what are any other contacts? Yeah, ask Doc, ask Doc Jock on Instagram. A lot of cases, like I said, up on there, and I love conversing with people on, on there. I mean, you talk on there. Uh, Facebook, Jock Jernigan. You can email me, Jock Jernigan DDS at Gmail. Also, like I said, those patient education videos I've created for these type procedures and dental implants in general. If you want to use them with your patients to help educate them, they're great and easy to just email the patient before you even see them to let them start educating themselves. You can get those on YouTube at Ask Dr. Jock. One personal request, Dr. Jock, when you write your book about full mod rehabilitation, please send me a signed copy, okay? <laughs> I will be sure to, I'll be sure to do that if it ever happens. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. Thanks a lot, guys. Y'all have a happy Friday and a good weekend. Take care. Bye, guys.